on episode 26 of Run Jump Stomp. I am joined by Mr. David Brevik. If you want to get Run Jump Stomp and my other shows ad free for as little as a dollar, check out patreon.com slash run jump stomp. Uh, share your thoughts on gaming by leaving a voicemail at anchor.fm slash run jump stomp slash message from any device. Let's get started. All right, you guys heard at the very beginning who I'm joined by. Now, some of you might not be familiar with the name, but I guarantee you are familiar with his work. Uh, very lucky to be joined by Mr. David Brevik today. If you're not, if, if you don't know who he is, he has worked at every level of the video game industry uh, from some of the largest companies like Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, he was a CEO of Gazillion Entertainment, and now he has his own studio, Graybeard Games. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure, and thanks for having me on. Oh, of course. Uh, so my first question for you is probably the toughest one out of all of them. Okay. In your expert opinion, is there more than one way to spell gray? Oh, obviously. Yeah. There okay. is. And, and uh, you know, I, I for Greybeard Games, it's gray with an A. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, the American spelling. But uh, there's many, uh, many G-R-E-Y. And a lot of people get a little confused on that. So that's uh, there are there are the two ways I only. Yeah, I that was something I didn't know for a long time. But because uh, I was brought brought up and taught that uh, G-R-A-Y was the only way to spell it. I, I grew up very, very close to Canada. And so I grew up with G-R-E-Y, even though I'm from the U.S. So uh, <laughs> I had like I, I I can't stop typing G-R-E-Y all of the time. So when I was looking for Greybeard Games, I was like, well, why am I what's wrong with me anyway? So uh, before yeah. we get to uh, all of the stuff that you've done, which has been a lot, what what games are you playing these days? Uh, well, right now I'm not playing anything. I, <laughs> I'm really focused on like, I'm having a little bit of a crunch period while I'm finishing up the, uh, my current project, uh, which comes out in, in about, uh, about less than two weeks, uh, at the end of May. And, um, but, uh, before that I was playing a bunch of things, that, but, uh, m uh, my wife and I stream a lot and she just finished uh, forager. And she enjoyed that a lot. And uh, before that, we were playing, actually, we were playing kind of an old school EverQuest, uh, EverQuest oh. 1. We were playing that, kind of a go back and play that kind of nostalgia like. Uh, uh, and then uh, recently, I've been, I play a mobile game called Star Wars Galaxy Heroes. And uh, before that, uh, we had done some Diablo mods and a few things like that. So you mentioned EverQuest. I have to admit, and uh, I, I adored Diablo 1. I adored it. Diablo 2 came out a, about a year too late for me because EverQuest had gotten its hooks into me <laughs> hard. And I didn't play anything else other than EverQuest when that came out. So did you play EverQuest a lot when it first came out back in 99? I did. I played uh, a lot not just then, but for probably about five years or so, uh, I played a lot of EverQuest. And uh, really that is uh, how my wife and I kind of fell in love. Uh, she worked at Blizzard as a programmer, and uh, but we would uh, go home in the evenings and play games online together. And we really got to know each other through that and kind of started our relationship through... Uh, through that so it's got it's not it's got a lot of special things about it that for me that uh, got a lot of special connections so i played it for a long time i played it on and off ever since then we've gone and we've been playing the uh the p the project 1999 servers uh mm -hmm. which are the kind of uh old school it's only got the first three expansions i mean first two expansions the the kind of vanilla and knark and the um the giants and dragons one uh Velius. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's got the and then the content stops there and uh it's got like a lot of the kind of 
old mentality and grind and all of that kind of is is still in there it's really hard to like get around the world and all those kind of things which they changed a lot especially after like planes of power and things like that so uh uh, anyway, it was uh, it, it, we've been having a lot of fun with that, and it's great to go back and visit it again. What class are you playing? Uh, I'm playing Necromancer. I played Necromancer first uh, in in actually I think I played Warrior for like a quick minute in uh, when I first started playing EverQuest. I played Necromancer for a long time, uh, but then I got into a death loop where I was going to fight Lady Vox and Bound at near the Frost Giants. Oh, that you no. have to kill to get in there and the raid was taking so long that uh, the giants respawned and i s died and spawned right at the foot of a giant and i got into this death loop where i was instantly killed over and over and over again i lost several levels uh and uh and like rage quit and couldn't log that character <laughs> in for years or whatever before i <laughs> eventually went back and uh and played a little bit more, but I never really got over. I switched to a bard after that, and uh, and I played bard for a long time. Bard and wizard were like my two main characters I played. That that's awesome. All right, so uh, you you definitely enjoy the RPG a lot, right? You like oh, that's yeah, your go to that's kind of game. Always been my jam. That's like the the uh, from starting on wizardry i think was like one of the very first ones i ever played to uh to playing ultima and that whole series and then on to uh uh like might and magic and a whole, a whole bunch of kind of old school rpgs like that and then obviously getting into rogue and roguelikes uh in college and uh and then that's all that i play largely i play role-playing games even today so, I mean, you mentioned roguelikes and RPGs. It seems like that was, was that the spark that lit the fuse that led to Diablo, the randomness of the roguelike with the RPG uh, stuff that you loved so much? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it was. It was the, the concept, uh, which you can actually find the original pitch document uh, for Diablo on my website on graybeardgames.com. There's a link and you can download the PDF that uh, that was the original document that we tried to shop when we were trying to shop Diablo around and get get a contract to, to make the game. And uh, and it was the premise was taking kind of one of those old old roguelikes and specifically one that I enjoyed the most, which is one called Angband and uh, and kind of updating that with graphics and making it, uh, uh, you know, look like a modern kind of game instead of, uh, you know, you're the at symbol attacking the letter K. Kind of thing. <laughs> right. Uh, I actually read that design document today, getting ready for the interview. Um, you at the very bottom of it, which if, by the way, I've never read a design document for a video game before. So I was expecting it to be really, really long. And, and I saw it on there and I was like, Oh, okay. We got a PDF. I can read a little bit and see how much it was. And I was like, oh, I'm at the end. That was really fast. So that surprised me. Well, it's just a pitch, you know, we yeah. didn't want to, <laughs> we had a lot more details than that, but that was like what we're trying to get to, uh, you know, a publisher who's going to give us like two minutes kind of thing. So that, right. uh, that was important to kind of keep it uh, short. So, so I, the things that I noticed in there, uh, were, well, there were a couple of things. The first thing that I noticed is the very end, you have a timeline uh how close was that timeline to reality and my guess is not at all <laughs> <laughs> not at all <laughs> one of the first lessons of video games is it always takes much longer than you think i mean in all fairness we changed a lot about the game right you know it that and that's what happens that's what's happened as well even on the in the new project i'm working on i thought oh i was going to spend a year on it and it's been a little over two and almost a half now and uh and so those kind of things happen like diablo in we changed it from a single player turn-based uh, game on DOS and like all of these things into multiplayer and real time. And uh, you know, it's just, there are, it grew in scope uh, quite a bit uh, over the course of the game. And they were all decisions that we made together uh, that were, it, we felt that was gonna be important for the game and make it a better game to do these things. So we, we you know, we knew the ramifications that it was going to take much longer, uh, but it it felt like it was worth it. I, I think it was definitely worth it. It's one of the, 
one of the pinnacles of, of video games out there. Yeah, almost everybody knows what Diablo is, and there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a reason for that. Um, something <laughs> else that jumped out at me when I was reading the design document is you had this idea, uh, and I say you, I mean Condor Games, um, but you, you guys had this idea of uh, expansions from the very beginning and selling mm -hmm. them as discs for $5. Now, Hellfire <laughs> for Diablo and the expansions for Diablo 2 were obviously much larger and more ambitious expansions than your $5 disc idea. But those those $5 disc ideas, they felt to me a lot more akin to what we have today with yeah. with DLC for games. Which expansion style do you think well, I don't want to say is best because there is no is best because there's whatever's good for whatever person. But which one do you prefer? Uh, well, what I liked about the idea and the reason we put it in there uh, was because I wanted to do something where we got a lot of frequent updates to the game and, and like doing kind of expansions was was one way to do do that but we wanted to make there to be a lot of ways that you can increase the you know if for you to have a lot of oh we're going to just make a new set of items and we're going to make that a little thing that you can buy for five bucks or you know some a new character class and boom you can make that for five bucks and so the idea was to have lots of like micro expansions uh and in the end we realized that uh like the metrics on, I say metrics, but we didn't even, I didn't even understand that word then, but the, the kind of the, the sales reports and stuff like that showed that you get diminishing returns on these things. And so uh, we felt like it wasn't going to be worth it to do that. And it was better to kind of like bundle up all of those things and put it into one, one thing that you sell right, and make that a bigger kind of expansion. Uh, and we'll get the we'll maximize our revenue that way rather than trying to do it into a bunch of little parts uh, where, you know, some people own some and some won't own others. And then there were some technical issues with that. And like, how do you see the items that other people have and you don't have, or what, what how do you prevent them from giving you these items and stuff like that? So it was like, there, there were, we were running into some technical problems with the concept. And so in the end, we decided it would be easier technically and uh, probably sell better to make it a full expansion. Do you think that you would make that decision the same way today with the the idea of this? It's super easy to just download everything like you don't have to have a box on the shelf someplace. Right. I don't. Uh, today is much different today. I, I think that either way would be fine. I think that uh, it, you can't really go wrong these days. Any way that you can uh, get more revenue by content uh, is acceptable to in this today in today's kind of gaming age and people are used to dlc small little packs as well as kind of big expansions and things like that so uh, whatever you think is going to be best for your product uh, would work what do you feel like you you learned from the experience of building diablo 1 and diablo 2 like what was the the takeaway for david from that uh Wow, there, there, there is so much that I learned. Um, you know, I think that uh, I learned that a, a lot of things that people really matter, teams really matter. Uh, I think that crunch can be uh, really uh, terrible and have pay a price not only personally, but also just physically and, you know, the uh, team wise and everything like that. Um, I learned, uh, you know, that I, I can be a decent game designer. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe in myself and my abilities. Uh, uh, and so there, there were, uh, there was a lot that I, that I came away with, but I think that, um, uh, you know, there were some lessons that I didn't learn that I didn't learn until later um, that because, uh, you know, what I hadn't learned is I hadn't learned failure. Like my very first PC title that I made was Diablo. I had made other <laughs> games before that. I had made some games on Atari Lynx and Sega Genesis and the Game Boy and things like that, uh, Super Nintendo. 
and uh so i had done other games uh but not never had really done uh you know a pc game like my own original kind of pc game i had always done kind of work for hire stuff for the most part and uh uh and so this was like an original production so getting to the point where you know i work really hard on something and it doesn't succeed was something i had not learned there and it was a super important lesson to learn uh and uh, so i think that uh you know there was a lot that i learned from there that was positive but i i, I certainly have learned a lot since then so uh you you mentioned a couple of things that i want to uh, touch on real quick uh you mentioned people like i know like david brevik the creator of diablo but david brevik didn't make Diablo by himself. You obviously right. had a team and people often forget about that. And obviously everyone on the team was probably indispensable, but is, are, are there people that you worked with on uh, Diablo one that stand out to you as, as like this game would not be what it is without that person? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's just about every person that worked on it. Uh, you know because they put people put their personalities into things and we did we were kind of uh the way that we organized blizzard north was very different than video game companies are usually arranged even today um in that you we ran it so that like everybody could contribute uh to ideas or uh you know give feedback and suggestions or make things happen in the game and so because of that, everybody on the team was kind of intimately involved in it. Um, so I don't know if there was necessarily, I mean, I think the most important people that played roles in the, in the product were people like Matt Ullman, who did all, all the music and sound effects and stuff like that, which are kind of, you know, super famous now. And, oh, yeah. uh, and that his skills and talents were, you know, made the atmosphere of the game quite different from other products at the time. And uh, uh, Eric Sh and Max Schaefer, my uh, business partners, who st I started Condor with, were super important getting the atmosphere and the graphics and stuff like that. Uh, uh, right. Uh, there were programmers that uh, did s things that were super important, like putting in multiplayer. I, I didn't even know how to make a multiplayer game. Uh, and so learning that from from some of the people that worked down south were like Pat Wyatt was moved up to the Northern California for for about four months or five months to help us with the multiplayer. And uh, he was super critical and uh, Alan Adham down in, in uh, who was the president of Blizzard at the time, eventually became Mike Morheim uh, and Alan eventually left, but now is back there. Um, but Alan was, you know, the person I interfaced with the most from and down south and working together with his, their suggestions and changes and things like that was super important. So there, there were there were just so many critical people and it was such a huge team effort that uh, it's hard to really single out that there was, uh, you know, uh, people that weren't important because I felt like everybody was and everybody contributed. Of course, of course. Um, you mentioned a couple times something that is kind of in the forefront of people's minds in a way that never really has been before. And that's the, the fact that developers have crunch. Uh, this ridiculous time at the end of development where you're trying to hit a date and you just like it's nose to the grindstone, ridiculous hours. Now you've been in both ridiculously large companies and now Greybeard Games where it's just you, right? Right. Which crunch is worse? Which like are you... <laughs> do you force yourself to work way more than you would anybody else because you're like well okay i guess i i gotta get this done and nobody else is gonna do it well uh, yeah i mean that in this situation right now it's a little strange i you know i i had a very terrible crunch period at the end of diablo 2 uh diablo 2 i i i only took off two days for the the whole year before it launched uh, and I averaged probably about 14 hour days. Um, and uh, and so I barely slept, I barely did anything. It cost me a lot of personal relationships and things like that. It was brutal on me. Uh, 
and and I was super burned out after after that happened. Um, and uh, so I kind of vowed at that time that I was never going to go through a crunch quite that severe uh, because it was a year long and that was that was <laughs> way too long. Uh, and so I've tried to avoid that, but I think that inevitably you can't really totally avoid it. I mean, maybe you can, if you have infinite money and you, you're a superb planner, but I'm, you know, neither of those things really are been in a reality for me. And so the, uh, uh, I think that I, having a deadline means that I really care about it and because I really care about it. I want to make it the best it can possibly be. And with time running out, I want to work as much as possible. It's really easy for me to work a lot because I'm kind of a workaholic anyhow. Uh, and I really am passionate about what I do and really proud of what I do. And, and I want to, you know, I want to make it the best it can possibly be. So I do end up crunching, but a lot of my crunch time, uh, like I'm trying to keep it just to a minimum, like we're, I'm only going to have, let's say a few weeks of crunch before uh, my new project comes out where I, I've been working on it hard. I've been, you know, putting in, let's say 60 to 80 hours a week working on it. Uh, but that's not that unusual for me. Like I working 60 hours a week is pretty normal for me. So uh, the, uh, you know, it's not, uh, that's not kind of out of the ordinary. And I try to try to balance that. And working at home has really helped a lot as well. I get much more time with my family and and uh, it forces me to take breaks and do other things like that so even though i'm working a lot i will you know take a break every couple hours and go up and chit chat with people or like a go run an errand or do some kind of event that the kids need to do oh we need to i need to take the kids to soccer or something you know whatever i'll do these other things that kind of interrupt my workflow uh and but it gives me but it's nice to have that kind of like change up and be and have kind of life grounding kind of activities uh, as well as mixed in with being able to work. And so even though I'm crunching, it's not, it's kind of a different kind of crunch than I've ever had. Well, you, you mentioned uh, your, your current project, which is coming out on the 29th of this month, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, May 29th, just very short time from now. <laughs> so are you done? Or is no. there still, okay, so you're not done and just waiting to hit the date. You still have a lot to do. Well, I don't know about a lot, but I, I do have stuff to do. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, I think that I'm just trying to, again, put as much in as I can before release. Uh, it's been in early access for uh, about a year, a little over a year. Um, and uh, so, and I've had a hundred, almost 160 patches in that year. Wow. Uh, so I update it like almost every other day. And, uh, and so it's grown and changed quite a bit over that time. So I'm not really worried about bugs or stability or like weird things like that, uh, because I've had so long, it's been in early access. I've had plenty of time to kind of like work out all these problems. Uh, so mainly I'm just like adding some more content, uh, because it's very similar to a Diablo style game in that it's got random levels and random loot and, and, uh, and eight different character classes and all these kind of things that so uh it in, in many ways is very similar to diablo so i'm put, adding like new ancient unique items and new uh affixes and you know things like that that are kind of like making it a more robust experience but if some of those things don't make it it's not the end of the world there's still plenty to to do and the game's really fun and so i a lot of the things I must do uh, are are done. There's probably only two things left that I feel like I must do, which is a little bit more music, and uh, which I've been working on kind of on the side, but you know the pieces aren't quite ready yet. And then uh, and then uh, I've got to do some story stuff that I'm uh, that that is kind of missing right now. And so getting those story things in, and then kind of doing some polish or whatever on the last kind of the features that I put in recently, then uh, that, uh, you know, I think that that's about it. But I still have a week and a half or so to, to do that, uh, which should give me plenty of time. I, I like your confidence. The uh, The name of the game we have yet to say yet, it's called It Lurks Below. Uh, you said it's Diablo-like, but can you give a, like an elevator pitch for it so that people who aren't, aren't aware of It Lurks Below, like what exactly is the game? 
So uh, it is a game uh, which is very much like Diablo meets, and, and people have said Terraria, uh, but I'm not a big Terraria player. Uh, it's kind of like 2D Minecraft or a game called Starbound. Uh, there was there, and I guess Terraria. Uh, so it's kind of got like this side perspective, like Terraria. Uh, it, you know, you see it's kind of platformery side view uh with uh so uh, the action and stuff like that is all kind of like this almost like a platformer uh look and uh there's kind of like a survival elements but largely it's like diablo like i said it's got bosses and eight different character classes and you level up and you've got different skills and you've got uh uh you know random items and you can you can so there it, it's very much like diablo but it's also got so the kind of core mechanics are like Diablo in terms of the RPG-ness and the, and the uh, random stats and things like that. Uh, and then it's got a lot of like survival-y kind of elements of uh, it's got, you know, lots of crafting and you do mining and you like kind of dig down into the world and uh, which is randomly generated, but it's, the world is not like a, a vast kind of open world world it's more like it's very kind of streamlined the whole point is to go down in the dungeon and kill monsters not to like go into different biomes and things like that that's like terraria did that just fine I, my game's more about a focus of like you're going down in this dungeon to like kill the bosses and and, and whatnot um and so uh it's a uh i'd say that it's kind of got like a crafting farming things like that survival aspect to it as well as this uh as as it plays a lot like diablo in terms of the stats and skills and killing monsters and the randomness uh so uh it's you know, high action lots of action and things like that uh and uh so that's kind of the elevator pitch so when you are all done with this on the 29th um is this the kind of game that you're going to ship and then move on obviously you'll fix bugs that come up or stuff like that or is this the kind of game where you have plans that you're going to do maybe your little little expansion idea that you had for in your original design doc for Diablo 1 are are you going to be expanding on this game or are you going to move on to a different project uh well i mean it depends uh <laughs> I, it largely I, I would love to support it a lot more i would love to it, it kind of largely depends on how well it sells if i if it like if I get 17 copies sold, I'm going to be in big trouble. I got to go get a job kind of thing. So the, uh, 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 I think that, uh, you know, if it sells well, I plan on supporting it and making this, you know, just continuing this as my full-time job where I'm, uh, you know, adding things to the game. I have, uh, one of the things that I wanted to add desperately to the game and started to work on, uh, but realized it just was going to take too long was adding a uh, skill trees to the different character classes. We, I have kind of a skill skills. The way you obtain skills is you get some, but you also find some. So you kind of like m mix and match the way you do skills, but the ones you got, were actually going to have some skill trees associated with them as well. So you could modify them even more. Uh, and I've kind of like put that on hold uh, so that for the, you know, 1.0 release. And then I hope to have a big content update that puts those back in for all the different character classes. It gives me the time to kind of like put those in because each one was taking about three weeks or so to to do one of these skill trees and uh, for each character class. And there are eight different character classes and that was going to be months and months of work. So I like backed off of that and said, okay, we're going to come out with that as a, as a patch later. And then most importantly, the, the biggest thing that I would love to add would be multiplayer and being able to play, you know, multiplayer over the, you know, being able to play with other people or whatever would be, I think just really fun. So uh, those are two big things I would really like to add to it. I would like to just keep adding more and more content. I could work on this game for a long time. So if successful, I plan on on, on adding it and then not only the, uh, adding to it, but also releasing it on other platforms and things like that as well. What other platforms do you have in mind? Uh, well, first and foremost, I'm going to uh, make uh, Mac and Linux versions of it, uh, which hopefully won't take me too long. Uh, but then I would really like to put it on the Nintendo Switch and uh, and then eventually on Xbox and PlayStation 
and then who knows phones anything whatever wherever i can put put the the game that would be great uh because i've spent a lot of time and effort and money and things like that on a product and so it just makes sense to try and put it on as many platforms and sell it wherever you can it, it like it, is it your own engine or are you using an engine that's easy to port to other um systems it is my own engine uh just like almost every game i've ever made has been uh has been my own engine i wrote my own engine for all of my cartridge games as well as diablo diablo 2 and and hellgate london and so uh you know i think that uh, i'm kind of used to the way that i work and i'm kind of a curmudgeon in fact uh that that i think that that somebody nicknamed my engine the crumudge engine so the uh <laughs> the uh, <laughs> uh you know i i like the those kind of old old style of being able to make the graphics do the things i want not use somebody's somebody else's uh, code to do that i can optimize it to be the best it can be that way and uh so i wrote my own engine for this but i use a, a library called sdl2 which uh allows for kind of cross-platform development for operating system level things like being able to read and write files off the disk and uh, and you know create a window and some stuff like that capture the keyboard or mouse or joystick input like all of that uh, like there's this one library that like you know you can use to make it compatible with all sorts of different systems uh, and so I use that uh, in, in the game creation uh, as a library that I use uh, to to do a lot of the stuff which helps a lot very very cool and you made everything in this game yourself right like the art the music everything yeah absolutely yeah that's exactly right that's, that's <laughs> uh, crazy. i did it all uh and you know i had been the the job i had before this is i was ceo at gazillion and um i started out as the uh, as the creative director on marvel heroes and then kept kind of getting promoted and eventually i became a ceo and uh, when you're the CEO of the company, like I wasn't really working on games anymore. And uh, and I spend all my days working about working on finance and talking to investors and, and things like that. And it got, got away from doing really the passionate part of my life, which was making video games. Like when I grew up, I said I didn't want to be a CEO someday, even though I'm very good at it and I keep seeming to get promoted into those kind of positions. Uh, I, it's not really my true passion, which is actually just creating video games. And uh, and so I want to kind of get back to that. And then I think I may have gone like a little bit too far, like taking been a little bit overzealous about how <laughs> uh, going back from the extreme of being a CEO where I was barely working on games to uh, to doing everything. I, anyway, I, 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 it's been a really fun experience and I'm really enjoying it. So I, you know, I, I'm really happy that I've made the choices that I made, but uh, it also makes it a lot harder and, you know, a little bit slower to to do all of this stuff yourself. That's that's really very very interesting. Um, we're going to talk about Marvel Heroes in just a second, but let's take a quick second to pay the bills. Well, excuse me, princess. All right, we are back, and David Brevik just got done telling us all about uh, his his game. It lurks below, and uh, we were talking about crunch and and all that stuff. But then he mentioned Marvel Heroes. Now, I was a big fan of marvel heroes i had a lot of fun in that game so thanks for making a and if you haven't played it it's diablo with spider-man basically i mean it's got all these characters that that everybody loves uh were you a huge fan of comic books and stuff like that growing up or did, was this just a happenstance yeah that's i mean that was exactly why i took the job uh this after kind of flagship studios and hellgate went away then uh uh, I said, well, what am I going to do next? And somebody approached me actually, um, turbine, which is the company, uh, that was, uh, out in Massachusetts. And they said, oh, we're going to set up this kind of West coast, San Francisco Bay area branch. And we're going to get the Marvel license. And we hear that you're a big Marvel nut. And there lots of people say, oh, David Brevik wants to make a Marvel game. He's, he loves it. It was kind of known. So they approached me and said, oh, we're going to make a Marvel game. Are you interested? I said, oh, yeah, I'd really love to make a Marvel game. 
uh, and uh, and they said, great, we're going to get the license. And you're going to set up a little sh shop out here. And then about six months into the job, they said, oh, we're not going to get the Marvel license. Somebody else got it instead. And so we don't have a job for you. Or how do you feel about moving to the East Coast and, and working on some of the products here? And uh, and meanwhile, the people that got the license, who which is this company called at the time was called NR2B, which is uh, uh, became Gazillion. Uh, my friend John Romero was there and he uh, said, oh, uh, you know, we heard you want to do a Marvel game. You want to come over here and do a Marvel game? <laughs> so uh, I said, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, we got the Marvel license. And so uh, I went over to Gazillion and was the kind of creative director on the Marvel project. I was the first person that was hired to do this this project. And I kind of brought a bunch of people from flagship studios and blizzard north and things like that people i'd worked with before and brought them in house to to make this uh make a, a marvel mmo was the was the idea and uh and so that that's how it like came to be was through this experience of yes i'm a huge marvel not this was a you know a dream project for me i really wanted to make marvel games for a long time and so i was super excited about it so when it first launched um, there was a little bit of backlash from the community and I, I couldn't believe how quickly, uh, Gazillion responded and made changes. Like, was that a terrifying time for you guys when, when it first launched and there were people who were upset about, it was like the, 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 the monetization model and the way that you guys had designed things. I think everybody was happy with the gameplay without a doubt, but people were unhappy about other parts of the game. Did that cause a lot of uh, grief for you? Yeah, I mean, it was a big problem uh, and it needed to be addressed right away. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we decided, one of the, one of my failings as uh, when I was doing this project is because I kept getting promoted, uh, like the creative director duties kind of fell by the wayside and we didn't really have a creative director and, and a vision holder. Cause I was like busy doing, I was a COO at the time, I, I believe. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually when it launched, I was CEO, but like late in the project, I was CEO of the company and I was like doing all sorts of, we had multiple projects and they had like 350 employees and somewhere in Washington, somewhere in Colorado, somewhere in the Bay Area. It was like there, there were different teams. It was, and so I was super busy, like running the company uh, and not focused on this project. And there was nobody really in charge uh, from a creative standpoint. And so, uh, it kind of showed in the end product uh, we had, I put somebody in charge, but only with like a few months left and they had kind of an impossible task. Uh, and then, so when the game launched, somebody, uh, this person approached me and, uh, and, and said, Hey, I think your game has a lot of potential and I I'm a creative director looking for a job, <laughs> bring me in and, and let me help you out. So I did. And, uh, and so we sat down together we inter I interviewed him and, uh, we sat down together and, uh, Jeff Donay is his name. And he, uh, really kind of helped a lot on the project. We kind of came up with a new philosophy on how to attack this and how to, how to, uh, respond and uh and we kind of stuck to this plan of how to bring how to, how to improve the product and in a lot of ways it was we should have launched the game into kind of early access which is really kind of where it was at the time mm -hmm. uh and then over a period of year we kind of re uh we kind of patched it every week we got in new features we put in new characters like and had this kind of like grind of of getting the game to a, to a state in which we were really proud of. And after that year, uh, we had made so many changes that it was uh, important for us to kind of like get eyeballs on it again. Uh, and uh, that was when we launched Marvel Heroes 2015. Putting that year on it uh, really helped a lot and got us kind of new attention. And we had raised our Metacritic from, I think it was like 
58 or something like that originally to 82 and uh so it was like the game had massively improved over the year uh including taking care of a lot of the backlash from prices and the bugs and it was there weren't enough features and end game and like all these kind of things that uh we really kind of changed the game dramatically over that course of that year and uh and became really just superb after after we had spent some time it's funny because diablo went through a similar kind of thing diablo 2 it wasn't super well received it was well received but not super well received when we came out with diablo 2 the original game but then after the expansion like it really started to take off and so i i think that this happens a lot with games uh where you know the original product isn't maybe as as good as it can be but after a year of kind of getting feedback and iterating on it and making it better, you know, it just improves the game. And so over time it becomes better and better. People kind of like look at it through rose colored glasses. Oh, I remember, you know, I don't really remember Diablo 2's launch, but I certainly remember the game after, you know, the patch 110 and things like that, that added all of these things and after the expansion and whatever. People look at Diablo 3 now and like the, it's very different than the way that it, it launched or they look at Marvel Heroes and the way it was versus, you know, it, uh, the way it launched. Uh, it went through this huge iteration as well. And so I think it's pretty common these days. I think it's common, but I think it's uh, it, the whatever you guys were doing behind the scenes to change the game uh, in order to uh, fix what people perceived as things that were were bad about it i just think overall it was a very impressive feat not many games come back from a bad launch there's a lot of games that have a launch and if it's a bad launch then they're dead forever um i i don't want to say that that's what's going to happen with anthem but that had a real bad launch and i don't know if they can recover uh final fantasy 14 had a terrible launch and then they did they kind of I don't know who did it first. Maybe they learned from you to put a new name on that game so they can get a new review out there so so people understand this isn't the same thing that we already had. This is new. We fixed things. Check it out. Uh, when they brought out A Realm Reborn and they were able to basically bring that back from the dead. And I feel like this can... Do you think that this can happen with single player games? Like if a game has a bad launch, do you think a single player game can do that? Or is there something inherently fixable about a game that has a, an audience that is playing together? Oh, I, I think that a single player game can do it and has done it. I had no man's sky. Oh, that, there you go. This. I didn't even think of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that it's really turned around. I mean, now it's kind of multiplayer, you know, it's like it, 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 they got like multiplayer light or something like that, uh, multiplayer aspects uh, of it. I, and I think it's supposed to be like even more multiplayer with a patch that's coming out pretty soon. But, you know, they really turned that game around uh, from just horrible horrible reviews at the beginning uh and people were just really upset uh and to something that everybody's like hey this, this is pretty good uh after what well, it took them about two years but it uh but they really stuck with it and they were lucky because they had a lot of funding and support and it sold pretty well at the beginning uh before there was like all this kind of backlash and uh and because of that uh, they were able to kind of continue and work on it and improve it and they they kept their heads down and their mouths shut and they worked and they and they they dedicated themselves to it and and they were able to like turn it around which is really just an incredible story and it's you know hats off to them for such perseverance in that uh that very difficult endeavor so with marvel heroes how much input did marvel have into the gameplay or was it just like this is the lore uh were they just writing it or like what it, what what was the relationship there uh marvel marvel had some uh well they introduced us to like uh uh bettis who wrote the the uh, bendis who uh who wrote the story uh and uh so they were involved a bit and they had like approvals on things like that uh uh and uh so they were involved a little bit and they were definitely involved in like the art and approving the way that the character looks and they kind of like had to review the skills to make sure that they are 
skills that the character that are in line with the way that the character is but largely we were able to like make the game that we wanted to make uh you know we were uh they, they had, we could decide where we wanted to go with the story and with the the characters and like how the gameplay would work and how you like level up your characters and things like that you know that like from the mechanics standpoint they were kind of hands off uh they just thematically wanted to make sure that it agreed with the ip which is completely reasonable and uh so they were involved uh but not like uh they were in the office every day working kind of thing they were just involved mainly in kind of an approval process great uh very interesting before we wrap up i just have a couple of questions not about your projects or anything like that but about the gaming industry as a whole and i'm curious as as a developer what are your opinions on some of these things? So I know that you um, you work with Tencent, right? Or you have yeah. to, to, in order to help, um, I can never remember, Pat, uh, P-O- Path of Exile. Pat, thank you. I can never remember the name of the game. Uh, I, <laughs> I play it. I bought I, I have it on PC. I have it on PS4, but I can never remember the name of it. Uh, Path of Exile, in order to bring them over to China, so you were working with Tencent with them. There's a lot of controversy right now because Tencent invested in epic games and there was all this stuff about tencent is stealing people's data it, it, it like I, i'm kind of building a little road here to get to how do you feel about what's going on with all of the controversies surrounding epic games these days well i think it's overblown uh you know i think that they've made some missteps and i think that they've uh you know that they it hasn't gone as smoothly as i think that they would have liked it to uh but i think that also people have you know like people are having a fit really almost over nothing i mean everybody's upset and rightfully so that some games that were on steam that people bought uh and then it becomes exclusive to the epic store like that was a blunder uh you know that that's a bad look for everybody involved in that but the idea that that a game would exclusively be on from the very beginning be on the epic store i don't think really is a big deal at all but apparently many people do and I think that the reality is just kind of like there's a developer side of this and then there's the consumer side of it from a consumer side of it i don't really get it but some people are upset because a they have like they have a bunch of steam friends and they have steam achievement things and stuff like that so it's like they're kind of home base and they don't want to they don't want to go get that you know do that kind of process in some other place so I kind of get that, I guess, but you know that stuff was never really all that important to me. The friends I want to play with on Steam, I have access to in many other ways besides just through Steam. Uh, so uh, that that doesn't really bother me. And then other people are like, "Well, what about you know? It's got to have more software on my my machine." But you know, I don't really think that that's that big of a deal either. Uh, you know, the, there's there's different stores for all sorts of stuff. And we're going to have more and more of these. There's, you know, the EA has its own, has origin and, you know, there's Battle.net and there's uh, uh, Steam. And so having Epic doesn't really, I don't really care about that. Uh, so, you know, I, I understand that maybe some people don't like some of those things, but I, I, that doesn't seem like a big barrier to me. So, but I, I understand that that is a problem for some people. The, uh, the other thing is that from a developer standpoint, it makes a ton of sense to go exclusive to the Epic store for two reasons. One is that there's less competition. One of the things uh, that is a big problem with Steam is actually getting visibility on your product. There are like 30 to 50 products a day released on Steam. And uh, and when there's that much competition, it's really hard to get noticed. And Steam was really great for indies and smaller games and things like that a few years ago, when uh, there were there were kind of it was kind of more of a curated platform. And so they they you know how many games were on there and what games could be on there and things like that. They worked more closely with developers and how to spotlight them and things like that. And so as a small time gamer you were glad to give up the 30% to this uh, to Steam to 
have them promote your game and expose it to millions and millions of gamers. But now Steam takes 30% and they're, you're lucky if you're on the front page for, for 10 minutes. And, uh, and so it's like the, the whole way that it works is very, very different than it used to be. And so people are a little, little upset about that from a developer standpoint that like they don't feel like they're supported by Steam anymore like they used to be. Uh, and and rightfully so, they just aren't. Uh, and so they think that why should they get 30% when they aren't doing the same things that they were doing when they got 30%. Uh, Epic Game Store, from a developer standpoint, they take a smaller percentage. I don't remember exactly what it is. It's like 12, 12. or 15. Yeah, I think it's 12%. And so them taking 12%, it's like, well, already I'm making more money. Not only that, but there's less competition over there. It's going to get more exposure. So from a developer standpoint, hey, that sounds great. And if Epic comes to this struggling little developer and says, here's a wad of cash if you make it exclusive <laughs> to the Epic Game Store, you can't blame them for taking a giant wad of cash to say, yes, please. You know, I mean, how many people are going to turn a giant giant bag of cash down? Uh, so I think that uh, it's, you know, from a business standpoint as a developer, I understand, like, it seems like Epic is a good idea. Uh, it promotes competition. Maybe Steam will change their ways, maybe the, to, to compete, as well as I get a bigger percentage over there. And I understand from a consumer standpoint that there might be some problems with that. But the idea that having exclusivity ruins the, uh, you know, gaming industry is false. These kind of things happened all the time. They happened in every kind of business. Uh, and uh, so Epic's just kind of following the, the, the kind of standard way of doing things. That doesn't mean they aren't making blunders. They're, they are. But having the idea of having some exclusive games to that is, is fine, especially because it comes out on other platforms. It's like exclusive for six months or a year, and then it'll be right. on other platforms or whatever. Do you um, think it's inevitable so that uh, Epic, once it gets big enough, will run into exactly the same problems that Steam is running into, where it's just too hard to promote something because there's too many games? It depends on how curated it is. Uh, if they only allow a certain amount of games on the platform, then you're gonna get you're gonna run into a situation where there's less, you know, there's less of that going on. There's gonna be, uh, they'll be able to, if they only have, let's say, even as many as ten games a week being launched on it, uh, that's a lot better than you know 150 games a week or whatever it is. You know, it's like that 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 when you have 150 games, it's hard to get eyeballs on 150 games versus whatever. 10 or 15. So it really just depends on the scale of what they what they do. If they if they open up the floodgates and let everything on it, then you're going to run into the same problems. And maybe they will because there's money to be done that way and that's why Steam did it. Uh but for now, at least it's from a developer standpoint it makes a lot, a lot more sense to go with Epic than anything else. And it seems like Epic is really trying to say, I don't feel like they're trying to appeal to co consumers nearly as much as they're trying to appeal to developers. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Uh, it, I feel like they're they're just trying to get the developers to consider them as an option. And by by limiting things, it makes it more attractive. I, I, I think that makes sense. Are, are you well, interested also, in- you know- Go ahead. That's, if they're gonna launch a platform, They've, they've got to have content, yeah. right? So they, they, their number one priority right now is getting content. If they have games that people want to play there, they have the exclusive content. If they have that magic content, they'll get the people, right? So uh, getting the people isn't the priority right now. It's getting the, the, the magic content that's going to get a lot of people on their platform. Is, uh, is It Lurks Below going to be ported there? at some point or uh, you just maybe someday but you know you know that's not really my focus right now because it's it was in early access way before i even knew about the epic store and things like that on steam i didn't want to do any kind of like deal i i haven't done any other platforms it's only available on steam mm -hmm. just mainly i've been focused on on having it on steam and and servicing that audience the best i can uh so real quick uh, you mentioned Metacritic earlier. How do you feel about their role in in the industry? How is how their role has kind of evolved into like this place where uh, games go to 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 die almost. Like if they don't hit these certain marks, it's like a doomsday for them. What do you what do you what are your thoughts on Metacritic these days? Um, 
you know i think that uh this is the case it's uh, this is the way it's always been um you know if a game is good you have a much better chance of succeeding than if you don't if it isn't very good so i think metacritic in some ways uh is good in some ways it's bad like i think that uh it's tough because so many opinions are kind of objective and you know subjective instead of objective then it gets into this like you can say oh this person doesn't like this type of game and they reviewed it and they reviewed it poorly and like then that can influence you know your overall sales and stuff like that and so they try and do things like with the steam where you get the you know the user reviews versus the the kind of metacritic style reviews or whatever like uh, they try and kind of enhance that or augment that, but there are problems with that as well. Uh, so I don't think that there is a perfect solution, uh, but uh, I think that largely uh, the Metacritic scores are fairly accurate to how good or bad the game is. Uh, and so it is a role that exists, but I think this exists, in, you know, in any kind of art form that's going to get critiqued, whether it be books or movies or, or video games or whatever it is, you're going to get critiqued and you're going to get some sort of like stars score, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, uh, that's just the reality of life. So that, uh, you know, there, there is no better solution or else we would be using that. Uh, and uh, so it is what it is. And the reality is that you have to learn to deal with it and hopefully come out with something that uh, that appeals to audiences enough that your Metacritic's going to be all right. Oh, very interesting. Before we get out of here, what games, other than yours, of course, are you looking forward to most right now? Um, uh, well, I'm looking forward to the... Uh, to the uh, Mario Maker 2, the Super Mario Maker 2 game. I'm looking forward to the new Pokemon uh, this fall, the Sword and Shield. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, on the PC, a game called Rebel Galaxy Outlaw. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to playing a little bit more in the Torchlight uh, Frontiers beta. Uh, I don't know when that's coming out, but uh, but I've been having fun with that. And uh, I think that those are really kind of like the, the things that are the most on my radar right now. Oh, a new, new Animal Crossing as well. Awesome. A, lot, a big Nintendo fan, it seems like. Yeah, I am. <laughs> oh, very cool. Uh, so where can people find your stuff, sir? So uh, they can find uh, in a variety of places. Twitter, I'm at David Brevik. On uh, my website is graybeardgames.com. It lurks below. It's in early access for just a couple more weeks or less than two weeks uh, on Steam for PC. And uh, you can also go to uh, my Twitch channel at Graybeard Games. I do development streams. And uh, so you can come take a look at that. It's I mean, Graybeard Games is my my Twitch name. And then your your wife also streams on Twitch too, right? Correct, and she streams as the Jungle Queen uh, on on Twitch, and we stream on that one mostly, you know, probably five or so days a week uh, uh, on in the evenings, Pacific time uh, uh, is when we stream there. Awesome! So thank you very much, David, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It was really fun talking to you. It was fun. I had a great time, and uh, my pleasure. And thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody, become part of the community over at runjumpstomp.com slash discord. You can also watch the show live over at twitch.tv slash runjumpstomp. You can get a hold of me on Twitter at runjumpstomp. Use the hashtag RJSPOD because I've got multiple shows and that helps me sort them. If you're looking for ways to support the show, stop by runjumpstomp.com slash thank you. And for more content like this, check out runjumpstomp.com slash shows. The music you are about to hear is Through a Cardboard World by Tony Lays. Make sure you check out their stuff over at runjumpstomp.com slash music. Bye, everybody.